Now that you've had surgery, let's talk about all the things that you'll need to know for going home in your post-operative care. Everything that we cover here is also provided in the written materials that we send home with you. You have a specialty bandage over your incision that was placed by your surgeon. What you see here is the knee, but the incision, the covering will be the exact same content whether you've had a knee replaced or the hip. This is a specialty bandage. The nice thing about this bandage is that number one, it's waterproof, and number two, it's impregnated with silver, which helps prevent infection. This was placed in the OR in a sterile environment. It will stay on for seven days. So seven days from when this was placed, you will keep this on. You will not have to touch or do any special wrapping or any additional bandaging. Like I said, you can go ahead and shower. It can get wet, soap, shampoo, whatever can run on there, and then you'll just pat it dry. Again, with this, you're not ever going to fully submerge the leg, so you're never going to soak in the tub, hot tub, or go swimming. It's just a quick shower. After seven days, you will go ahead and remove this bandage just like you would a Band-Aid. It peels off very easily go ahead and discard that bandage. At that point in time, the incision should be healed and you won't need to do any more wrapping or bandages. Again, you're never going to clean the incision, so you're not gonna use any peroxide, lotions, ointments, neosporin, vitamin E, anything on that incision, just keeping it clean and dry. You will wanna watch and closely monitor that incision for any signs of infection any signs of red, hot, swelling, oozing, pus, green stuff, or anything that when you look at that incision, something just doesn't look right, or if you had a fever over 101, you would wanna call your surgeon and let him know right away. Also, in very rare cases, you might have a little bit of reaction from this adhesive. If that were to be the case, definitely let your surgeon know right away and they would instruct you what their preferences would have you do for wound care at that point in time. Now we're going to talk about swelling and bruising. Right now you probably don't have a whole lot of swelling or bruising, but just know that when you go home in the next few days, it's very common for that bruising to then surface. Sometimes it takes several days, three, four days, so don't be alarmed if even in the next few days, all of a sudden your whole leg is bruised, that's totally normal. We've also given you a handout in your Total Joint Notebook that has pictures of normal swelling and bruising. Go ahead and reference that. That's a really great uh, thing to look at when you go home just to see if you're you know, looking normal or not. If you ever have questions, definitely give us a call and we'd be more than happy to answer questions. But when you go home, one of the things that's really gonna help you out is ice simple and very effective. The nice thing about ice is most people have ice. I don't care what you use. Ice packs, gel pack, frozen peas, they all work as long as it's cold. You can even make a very inexpensive version of an ice pack or gel pack. We've included that in your handouts, but also I can tell you it's just rubbing alcohol and water. It's two parts water, one part alcohol, so very simple. Pour that in a Ziploc bag, I would double bag it, freeze it. The nice thing about that alcohol is it never allows that ice to completely get rock hard. So it's really nice way to ice because you want to be able to mold that around the area. So especially for knees, you want it up and around the knee. And then for hips, you kind of want to get it up and under the buns a little bit. And you don't want to be sitting on a really hard ice chunk. Also, another alternative of a homemade version Super simple, caro syrup. The nice thing about caro syrup, again, take a full bottle, just go ahead and pour all of that into a Ziploc bag, again, double bag it. Um, the nice thing about that caro syrup is it always stays nice and pliable. It stays nice and squishy. So again, you can really mold it to that area that you wanna ice. Couple things that you do wanna know and remember when you use ice. First of all, you only wanna keep it on there about 30 minutes at a time. So 30 minutes on and then go ahead and take it off. Give yourself a couple hour break and then do it again. You definitely wanna be icing after you've done any exercise, therapy, walking, or any time that you just feel stiff, sore, swollen, go ahead and have some ice on there. You really can't overdo. Second of all, the ice really never needs to be directly up against the skin. You always wanna make sure that it has some kind of a cloth barrier. Usually your ice pack gel packs, if they don't come in their own mesh covering, throw it in a pillowcase. That's a great barrier because that ice can still penetrate, but it's still allowing you to get that um, protection from the ice, but it can still really numb and deaden those top layers of skin because you kind of want that little bit of a bite from the ice and that's really helping with pain control as well. 
rest. So 30 minutes on, an hour or two off, do it many times throughout the day. As often as you can be thinking or doing it, it's really going to help you with that swelling. Also, um, elevation. We like to say keep your toes above your nose. So if you can tolerate it, anytime you're laying down, sitting in a chair, go ahead and get that leg propped up on some pillows and ice it. That's also going to help with that swelling and give you better pain control. So when you go home, you can't overdo it. Ice the heck out of your joint. That's really going to help you in the long run for pain control as well as your swelling and your bruising. At this point in time, we're going to talk about your activity, probably the most important part in your recovery process. It's very important that you stay moving. We know that the more weight that you can put on that joint, it's going to stimulate bone growth, meaning that your bone is going to adhere to that new prosthetic, that artificial joint, and by doing that, you will heal faster. You'll have less pain and you'll have less swelling. So it's really important to do all of your exercises twice a day. It's best if you can try and break it up and do one session in the morning and one session in the evening. So try and get yourself into a routine where you get up in the morning, get a little something in your stomach to coat your stomach, take a pain pill. Let that kick in for about 30 minutes and then go ahead and do your series of your exercises. Give yourself a good rest period and some ice and then fast forward to the evening. You're gonna repeat that same protocol do some pain medications, let it kick in for about 30 minutes, and do those full set of exercises. The therapists have gone through these exercises with you. Hopefully you have very good understanding. If you don't, let us know. Also, you can refer in your total joint notebook. There's a section in the back with the, all of the exercises pictured here for you. You can refer to this or you can call the rehab department directly and they can answer any questions for you. Also, for the knee replacement patients, if your physician has instructed you to use a CPM or a continuous passive movement machine, we like you to use that twice a day. If you can do that three times a day, that's great. Usually we say try to do three times a day, two hours each session. Try not to go more than two hours at each session. What happens if you go longer than that, you end up with a little bit more pain, some swelling and stiffness, uh, and it can cause some more discomfort. So don't, in this instance, think, well, if a little bit's good, then a whole lot's better. Try and just limit it to the two-hour session or as much as you can tolerate. That's also a fabulous time to be icing your knee while you're in that CPM. Now let's talk about your pain. Hopefully here in the hospital we've found something orally that's working well to control your pain. When I say well, meaning that you're able to get up and participate with therapy and do your exercises, you're also able to get up and go to the bathroom if you need to. When you go home, it's very important that you follow these same precautions to give yourself the best outcome for pain management. So when you're home, you're going to follow that same pain scale that we use here in the hospital. When your pain level is a three or a four, that's when you want to medicate. You're not going to wait until your pain level is way up to a seven or eight because by that time, you're going to be chasing that pain. You're never going to get caught up. So by being proactive and preventative, you're going to have the best outcome for pain management. Also, when you take your pain pills, it's very important that you always make sure that you either have something in your stomach or you take a little snack. It doesn't have to be a full meal, crackers, milk, yogurt, just a little something to coat your stomach. Get that in your stomach first and then take your pain pill. Also, it's really important to track and write down the medications that you're taking. We will send you home with one of these pain medication records that you can take home and also follow with the date, the time, what your pain score is before you take your pain medication, uh, and then also the dose so that you know that if you're taking one or two at a time, give yourself about a half an hour, 45 minutes for that pain medication to kick in. Then you're gonna write down your pain score again. Ideally, obviously, we wanna make sure that that pain level is coming down, but if for some reason your pain level is not, or even if it's increasing, you're gonna to wanna to make note of that. This is a great communication tool, so if you're finding that your pain is not being well controlled, you're gonna to wanna to notify your surgeon and let him know, and this is a great way to communicate that with him. Also, with the pain medication, uh, one of the blessed side effects that comes with pain medication, constipation. We've already talked about this a lot, we've covered this, but it's very important that you stay and be proactive with that as well. 
With the surgery, we've given you anesthetic that slows down the gut. You're not up and moving around like you normally would. And now, we've thrown narcotics on top of that, and that also shuts down the gut. So all of these things contribute to you having issues with constipation. So here in the hospital, we've had you on a medication, a combination stool softener and laxative. We highly recommend that you continue to follow that same regimen at home each and every day while you're taking any of those narcotic pain pills. Also, other things that can really help with that, the more that you're able to get up and move, the more you walk, that helps stimulate the gut and that helps it keep moving as well. Lots and lots of fluids, healthy water, juice, crystallite, those non-caffeinated beverages to keep you hydrated. Also, healthy diet, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables and the lean proteins, those are also gonna help with the constipation. Also in your paperwork, we have tips and uh, prevention and management listed for you for any issues with constipation. Definitely follow and refer to that if you have questions or you can always contact us directly here at the hospital and speak with one of the coordinators. All of these things will help to give you the best outcome for your pain control as well as your activity. Let's talk about the prevention and management of blood clots. After your surgery, we take a lot of precautions to help minimize the risks of that. You're placed on a medication to help thin your blood. We have leg squeezers or um, the SCDs that are placed on your legs and it's a me mechanical device to increase the circulation in the backs of the legs. We get you up and walking right away. That's a great way to really help that circulation moving in the backs of the legs. And then we teach you to do those lovely ankle pumps and ankle rolls. Anytime you can be thinking about sitting in your chair, bed, whatever, watching TV, just keep moving those ankles and that's also gonna help keep that circulation moving. Some physicians go above and beyond that and they have you wear these lovely Ted Ho stockings. Basically, it's just a long compression sock that you'll wear from anywhere to two to six weeks depending on your surgeon's preference and that will be highlighted for you on all of your paperwork. These are designed, like I said, to compress the legs to help with swelling. Usually, you're gonna be wearing these pretty much all the time. You can have them off for about two hours a day, so around the time that you shower, you can take them off, let your legs air out and breathe, and then you put them right back on. Yes, they're tight, they're a booger to put on. We all hate wearing these and putting these on too. A couple things that will make it a little bit easier for you. Um, if you don't already, we'll send you home with one of these nice, thick, heavy-duty plastic bag. This will come in handy for when you do put on your stocking because basically you're going to use this bag and we'll pretend this is my bare foot. So bare foot goes in the bag and then you're going to take your stocking and basically the stocking is just going to go up and over the bag and this bag helps it to slide a little bit easier up and over the heel is where it's gonna to wanna to get hung up. And then basically you're just gonna get all of your wrinkles worked out, get that all the way up the leg. And then this hole comes in handy because now you can pull out the bag out the bottom and that just makes it a little bit easier because you're gonna find that it's gonna to wanna to get hung up on the heel. This, the bag allows it to slide a little bit easier up and over the heel. Now also, this top elastic band. I don't ever like to really see this up against the skin. I've seen some really bad blistering occur from the heat and pressure of that. So I always tell people, roll this away from your skin. Unfortunately, yes. Um, anytime you're up and walking, standing, your stockings are gonna wanna fall down. So every now and then you're gonna have to pull up those stockings, work out any wrinkles. It is gonna wanna tend to wrinkle behind the knee and that's typical. So go ahead and work those wrinkles out because that can also pinch and cause some irritation as well. Also, this top elastic band, usually that's to fit kind of the mid to upper thigh of the leg. Um, if it's ever too tight, if it's leaving a red line, a mark, an indentation of any kind, it's too tight. It's actually doing more damage than good. So if that's the case, just go ahead and roll that down a little bit more, loosen it up on the thigh. Last thing we wanna be doing is cutting off any kind of circulation. So just um, let us know if you're thinking that it's too tight or if it's the wrong size. We'll definitely get to the right size before you go home. Now, for laundering. With these, you definitely wanna either just hand wash or machine wash them, and then go ahead and air dry them. Just hang them on a towel rack, wherever. They dry pretty quickly. Don't put them in the dryer. You probably won't get them back on because of the size. Like I said, you'll wear these anywhere from two to six weeks. After that point in time, go ahead and wad them up, toss them, do the ceremonial toss, you're done with them. Uh, but definitely, these are very important, so if your surgeon has prescribed these for you, definitely follow through and wear those. Um, Again, we'll send you home with an additional pair so that you can rotate and launder those for, for the duration that you get to wear those. 
Also, like I said, you're on a medication that helps thin your blood. Depending on your surgeon will dictate what medication that is. There are a couple signs of too much bleeding that you will want to watch out for. And usually there's the three hallmark signs. If you had a nosebleed that won't stop within 30 minutes, if you're brushing your teeth and your gums start to bleed, not like, oh, I floss my teeth and I get a little bit of blood. This is like your whole toothbrush is bloody. Or you go to the bathroom, blood in your urine, blood in your stool, not normal. You definitely want to call and let your surgeon know that right away. Also, be mindful that you are on a blood thinning medication, so you are more prone to bruising and bleeding. So if you did bump into a coffee table or something, you are going to bruise where you probably wouldn't. And for you know those of you that shave, just be cautious that if you do shave and nick yourself, you are gonna bleed more than you probably would otherwise. So just be cautious. If you have any questions or concerns, definitely call and let us know. Now, despite all of these precautions that we do take to help minimize the risk of a blood clot, some people do still develop a clot. How do you know if you have a clot? That's a good question. So typically you would know that because if you're going to get a clot, most likely it's going to be in the operative leg, in the calf, or in the upper thigh. You can also have it in the non-operative leg, but typically it's in the operative leg. And like I said, you would typically know that because that calf would suddenly become very red, hot, swollen, very painful. And also, if you were to take in a relaxed position your leg and someone were to take your toes and push them up towards your nose, you would want to jump out of the bed because it hurts so bad, accompanied by red, hot, swollen, and painful. Now you guys are all going to have stiff, sore, tight calves. This is different. This is a more intense kind of pain, again, accompanied by the red, hot, swollen. Any suspicion, any question that there might be something going on down there, definitely call your surgeon and let them know. Typically, they would have you come in and do an ultrasound just to verify that. If there is a clot, that's not a terrible thing. We could manage that with medication. The problem is if you do have a clot, it could break free and travel up to the lung, and that's when it becomes a life-threatening event. So that's why we do take this so seriously. So heaven forbid, if you did ever develop severe shortness of breath, pain in your chest, not like, ooh, I'm kind of winded, I just walked up the stairs, but really can't catch your breath, that's a 911 phone call or get yourself to the emergency right away. The chances of that happening, super, super slim, and especially if you're following all of these precautions and doing all of these things to help um, prevent and minimize the risks of a blood clot. When you go home, hopefully we've provided you with all of the tools and resources to give you a successful outcome for your recovery. However, there might be some times when you would need to notify your surgeon and let them know if you have any questions or concerns. If you have, like we mentioned before, pain that's not being controlled by your medications, or if you have new or a change in your pain, if for some reason you have any suspicion or signs of an infection, like we had talked about earlier, especially a fever over 101, or if you have any problems or changes with your bowel and bladder or issues with constipation, definitely give your surgeon a call. But really, you're going to be the best judge, so if anything to you just doesn't seem right, definitely give your surgeon a call and let them know and ask them those questions. When you go home, know that you're probably going to have some up and down days, and that's a normal part of healing. You probably, if you haven't already, had one of those moments of asking yourself, oh my goodness, why did I even have this surgery? This is not what I expected it was going to be. And if you had, great, you've knocked that out early. But just know that that's very common to experience in these first two weeks. When you go home, you're probably going to have a little bit more pain, and that's also a normal part of that healing process. So just anticipate that. Again, know that you're going to have these up and down days and that's typical so roll with them know that they're coming usually that first bummer of a day usually hits about day four or five at home and you're having a little bit more pain swelling things just get a little bit harder so just know that that day's coming and just take that with a grain of salt and muscle through that also, it's very typical for patients to be taking the pain medications or the narcotics for about two weeks. Usually by then, you feel better, you have less pain, gradually you taper off of those medications. What you want to avoid is getting to that two-week 
period and suddenly stop taking those narcotics, your body can go through withdrawal. That doesn't mean that you're addicted to the medication, it just simply means your body's used to taking that and if you suddenly take that away, your body can go through withdrawal. So over a four or five day period, just extend the amount of time that you're taking the pain medications each time or instead of taking maybe two at a time, drop it down to one and then add some plain Tylenol to help bridge and keep you with good pain control. I will caution you with Tylenol, just be careful that you're following the instructions on the packaging and you're not taking it any more frequently or you're not taking any other medications that has Tylenol or acetaminophen in it. The latest FDA guidelines recommend that you not take any more than 3,000 milligrams or 3 grams of Tylenol in 24 hours. So just be cautious and be careful to read the instructions on the packaging. Also driving. That's a big question of when can you drive. Typically the surgeons will ask that you wait and drive until your two-week follow-up appointment with them because again usually by that point in time you're still taking narcotics and it's not advisable to drive while you're taking any of those narcotics. Also when you go home know that yes you're gonna have some of those up and down days expect them know that they're coming. By two weeks things get easier. You feel better, you have less pain, that's kind of a, a landmark time. But by six weeks, that's kind of that magical, oh my goodness, I haven't felt this good in so long, I can't believe I waited so long to have my joint replaced. Okay, it is a healing process. Allow yourself to go through that healing process and be patient with yourself. Don't rush things. If you get into a situation where you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and use us as a resource. That's what we're here for. Or get in touch with your surgeon. It's been a pleasure caring for you and we wish you all the best and a very uneventful recovery.